treated like a king. I don't know about you, but if, um, if you have someone of significant importance coming to your house, you do some things to prepare, right? Um, probably if you said, well, the president or you know, some uh, dignitary or whatever was coming for lunch today, many of you wouldn't be here right now. You would be at home making sure that the roast wasn't going to burn and that the, uh, that the floors were swept and that everything else was tidied up. And, uh, and I can tell you, um, I had a, uh, we had a wedding here this summer and at, our, at our house. Well, it wasn't at our house, but we had the, a lot of the folks from the wedding, the relatives and whatever, over uh, kind of in the day, day or two before the wedding. And I felt like I spent all summer getting the house ready for that one night a picnic you know we uh we found out that you know that the the deck chairs were they were all ratty and people were i had already broken two or three of them so i we had to go get a new new set of deck chairs and we um you know we got an umbrella we didn't our umbrella didn't, didn't work and so there was like it was an outdoor thing but still it was like it was like all these little things and then of course the day or two of well you got to make sure the grass is mowed perfect you know got to go around and make sure i do the weed eating that's something that i just I don't know, I put off. I, yeah, it's not something I, I tend to do every week, but I should. Uh, I had to go, go through, make sure all of the, you know, make sure all the pruning was done, prune back the flowers. We have bamboo that grows, make sure it's tr trimmed right, you know, and all this other stuff. You know, it just felt like, you know, the whole summer was, was geared to that one event, right? And, uh, and then it was over, and then, okay, now what do we do, you know? But, uh, but nonetheless, uh, if someone important is coming to your house and you want to really put your best, port, point, uh, best foot forward, you do things to show them that type of respect, that type of we're, we want to welcome you, we want you to enjoy it, we want, you to, we want to put our best foot forward. You know, in, in terms of like thinking about your of a, of a dignitary, what do they do? They, they say you're rolling out the red carpet, right? Rolling out the red carpet for them. You're going to give, you're going to get out the best china. You're going to get out the, the nice glasses, not the old dingy ones, you know. You're going to get all the best stuff out so that you can have a way to show that this is the best that I can do. And, uh, you know, thinking about it in terms of what we see here today uh, in this passage, you think about Jesus Christ of course, we know sitting here 2,000 years later, uh, you know, he's, he's the king, right? <laughs> he's the king of kings. He's the Lord of lords. The, Isaiah told us that. But yet here we are in a situation where his greatest accusation was being called the king of the Jews. And yet we're going to look this morning at the treatment that he got that was associated with this kingship that he was ascribed. And I want us to look through these this morning because I think that there are some things uh, in our own lives that I hope that we can uncover as we go through these verses about maybe some of the ways and some of the times we haven't always treated him like our king either. Because the fact of the matter is, sometimes we don't always put him in that place of kingship in our life. Certainly they didn't here. And we're going to look at some of the attitudes as to why uh, why they didn't acknowledge Jesus as their king, and what were some of the barriers that, ha that were put up that prevented that from happening. So uh, verse 28, when, where we started the reading this, this morning, verse 28, of course, we, we've, we've been working through the passage. We know Jesus was taken from the Garden of Gethsemane. We know he was brought before the council, and uh, he was brought first before Annas, and then eventually before Caiaphas, who was the high priest, and uh, taken, taken from there then to the Roman authorities. And that's where we pick up the story in verse 28. It says, They led Jesus from Caiaphas, who was the high priest, unto the hall of judgment. This was a Roman, Roman place now, a Roman hall of judgment. And it was early. Now, why was it early? Because they had been up all night uh, having their little, uh, as I said last week, kangaroo court which I knew some of this was a new term for some of you. But the fact is that this was, a, this was a, a mockery of justice. And they had taken him from the garden late at night. They had dragged him into this, you know, impromptu and unwarranted and unjust court session before the high council. And here it was early the next morning, 
And uh, this is where, where Jesus, now they're bringing him before the Roman authorities. It says, And they themselves went not into the judgment hall, lest they should be defiled, but that they might eat the Passover. I want us to just acknowledge, first and foremost, this, this point here, which I think is, is, is kind of an oxymoron in a lot of ways. These, these men who were supposed to be the spiritual leaders of Israel, these ones who had taken Jesus with their, with their angry mob, right, the night before, and had put up this court session all night, and they couldn't even find witnesses to agree to accuse Jesus, right? They had done all these mockeries of what God's law was and what they were supposed to represent in terms of spiritual justice and spiritual truth. Here they come before the Roman authorities, and they're like, oh, we can't go in the judgment hall. We wouldn't want to defile ourselves, right? Uh, this, this is, I think, really the, the point that we, we see time and time again made about the Pharisees. Uh, they were a lot of uh, hypocrites, right? <laughs> Doesn't Jesus call them that time and time again? So why is it the first point that we want to just make out of this? They had their own holiness. They had their own sense of honor that they didn't want to disrupt. And that was really one of the first points and first reasons why they didn't want to acknowledge Jesus as their king. Uh, they, they wouldn't want to go in and, and defile themselves before a Roman judgment hall so that they could res observe their own religious practices. As if they weren't already defiled enough for the shameful handling that they had done uh, to, they given to Jesus. Uh, they, they weren't even able to have witnesses agree, as we've mentioned. Uh, really, what, what does this amount to? They were more interested in ceremonial purity than justice. They were more interested in making sure that they were dotting their I's and crossing their T's and making sure that they were, you know, looking, you know, how would it look if to all the people if we were to go in and let ourselves... It was all about look. It was all about, I have my honor, we have our practices, we're going to make sure we look squeaky clean in all this, even though on the inside, what does Jesus call the Pharisees time and time again? You're whited sepulchers, right? And you look good on the outside, but inside are full of dead men's bones. This is what the Pharisees were full of. They had their own sense of holiness. They wanted to project this sense of having honorability amongst what they were doing, uh, but in the real, real truth of it, they weren't. And you know, this is true, I think, today, because I think a lot of people don't accept Jesus for the same reasons. People tend to feel like, well, I have my own sense of honor. I have my own sense of dignity. I have my own sense of self-worth. And if you accept Jesus Christ as king, what does it do? What did Jesus do to them? He pointed out... <laughs> where their honor fell short. He pointed out where their holiness or their righteousness was like filthy rags, right? He, it just in terms of living, think about living next to and in front of someone who was truly sinless. Now, you, you always probably think of somebody you live next to who was a goody two-shoes, right? But I'm not talking about that. Um, think about you living next to somebody who was truly sinless in every form and every fashion. This was Jesus Christ. He didn't have to even say something. To these people right for them to realize hey i don't measure up to what this guy's about <laughs> you know, just him standing there in his sinless state had to be convicting to people around him but yet you know what they didn't want that disrupted i have my own sense of holiness i have my own sense of honor i i want to project my own goodness and you know what happens they um they they want to reject him they, they don't want Jesus Christ to condemn or, or to, to expose who they are in that holiness, holiness that they have. And so what do we see in verses 29 and 30 then? He says, Pilate went out unto them and said, What accusation bring ye against this man? And they answered and said unto him, If he were not a malefactor, we would not have delivered him up unto thee. Now, this is the second part of this, having this sense of holiness and honor. Because not only did they have this, I'm not going to go in, now it was almost this indignant answer, right? Do you know that in Roman rule and Roman customs and the, the way they had their court system, which, by the way, is based, our current court system is based much on the Roman court system. Uh, and one of the things that is as brutal and, you know, volatile as the Roman government was, 
Uh, the fact is they did have this sense of we're going to have due process. We're going to have justice served. And so one of the things they always made sure of is that a proper accusation was made against whoever was being accused of committing, uh, you know, a, a, a breaking a law or whatever it was, being a criminal. And that criminal, that defendant, was going to have the opportunity to defend themselves against those charges that were made. This was part of the, 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 the standard due process you got in Rome. And do you notice what they say to him when he comes out, which is a normal question. What accusation do you bring to this man? Uh, okay, let me hear the charge. What are the charges against him? Do you see what the answer is? We don't have charges against him. Can't you just take our word for it? You're, you're going to question whether we don't have valid reasons to bring this guy before you? Do you know who you're looking at? <laughs> We are the Pharisees. We are the ruling spiritual council of the Jewish people. You can't just say, if he were not a malefactor, do you, would we really have brought him to you? Like, you dare question? We shouldn't even have to give you an answer for this accusation. This is, the, this, is this um, state of disbelief that they're trying to put before Pilate, this sense of, how dare you ask me this? This is, this is the way this is phrased. He says, if he were not a malefactor, we would have not delivered him up to thee. We have our own integrity. Why would you question us? Is not our word good enough to put this man to death? That's really what they're saying. We have our sense of honor. We have our sense of dignity here. But the fact of the matter is, and the truth of it all, that the council did not actually have any formal charges against Jesus that would have held up one iota in a Roman court. That was the truth of the matter. They just wanted Pilate to take him and do what they wanted for him. And so what did they do? They wanted to defend their honor. They wanted to defend being right at all cost. And in the course of doing that, they had shown time and time again they had none. You know, I think that's true for a lot of people that don't want to accept Christ today as well. We just want to defend why I'm right. We just want to defend why I've got an excuse, why, how, you know, you get, you, you ever get somebody who's like, they're in your face about something, right? And the next thing you do is you say, well, how dare you ask me that, right? I'm going to fight back, you know, I might, they might have a point, but I'm not going to let them know, <laughs> right? This is, this is how we get, we get, I don't want my honor to be trampled upon by your questioning. And we daren't have that. Because the fact of the matter is, it all boils down to a source of pride in our life, doesn't it? This was the issue with the Pharisees. It was an issue of pride. They couldn't give up their honor. They couldn't give up this projection of holiness because there was too much pride in their heart to allow Christ to come and be king. That takes humility for, for, uh, for Christ to come in and allow him to be Lord and king of your life. And you know, pride often gets in the way of us allowing him to be king in our lives as well. So we look at these verses and um, just a little bit of background that John doesn't give us, but some of the other gospel writers do, because I think it's important as we go and look at verses uh, 31 and 32, because we kind of, John kind of skips over this point, but you know, they did eventually bring some charges before Jesus. Uh, and the charge that was given was one of blasphemy. You may remember this from some of the other gospel accounts. What was the charge? It was the charge of blasphemy. For them, the blasphemy was that he claimed to be Messiah, the Christ, the Son of God, the one who had process, prophesied in the Old Testament. Mark chapter 14 tells us uh, this account of what happened in that council as Jesus was standing before them and they were trying to question him, it says he held his peace and he answered nothing. And it says the high priest asked him and said unto him, Art thou the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? And Jesus said, I am. And ye shall see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. And then the high priest rent his clothes and saith, What need we any further witnesses? Ye have heard the blasphemy. What think ye? And they all condemned him to be guilty of death. So he was charged with blasphemy. Of course, it's not blasphemy it's, if it's truth, right? Jesus Christ was the Messiah. He was the Son of God. He, he only gave them the truth 
But for them, it was a charge of blasphemy. But do you realize for the Jewish people, you are now bringing someone who was charged with blasphemy before a Roman court? You ever think about this? Why do the Romans care anything about whether somebody claims to be the son of God or not? You know, what does that have to do with the Romans at all? They don't care in the least. This is this predicament that they were put in. They could care less what someone claimed to be. They were there to continue to preserve law and order, to continue to keep the Jewish nation under subjection, and uh, they were going to make sure that there weren't going to be any more uprisings, right? That was their main issue. They... Uh, they may have been, uh, sure, Pilate was very well informed about, it was less than 200 years earlier that the Maccabean revolt had taken place. And for a short time, uh, the Maccabees had come and, and fought Rome out of the, the city of Jerusalem and had taken back this power. There was a great revolt, and Rome had briefly lost control, and uh, they were going to make sure that didn't happen again. They were there to put down the uprisings when they happened. And so you see what happens by the time... Uh, they bring him to Pilate, they realized we can't charge him before Pilate with a charge of blasphemy because Pilate's just going to laugh in our face. So what do they do? It says in Luke 23, let's, let's turn there if you will. Luke chapter 23, it gives the other account. What did they actually end up telling Pilate as an answer uh, for the charge? Now originally in all the gospel accounts, they begin by saying, uh, this was, uh, you know, just take our word for it. But when, um, when push comes to shove, here's the excuse that they give. It says in Luke 23 in verses 1 and 2, The whole multitude of them arose and led him unto Pilate, and they began to accuse him, saying, We found this fellow perverting the nation and forbidding to give tribute to Caesar, saying that he himself is Christ a king. Now, if that's not twisting somebody's words there, I don't know what is. But do you see the accusations? This is no longer just an issue of blasphemy for them. They brought it, they twisted it in such a way, they spun the story, so to speak, before Pilate. And they said, Pilate, here's the issue. This guy is telling, he's going all over the nation. He's telling people, you don't have to pay your taxes. And he's telling people that he is Christ, the king. He's going to be king. He's going to take over. He's, he's going he's gonna to revolt and make, make sure people don't pay taxes to Rome anymore. Now, of course, we know what the truth is behind all of this. But do you see, even if this was the true accusation, how absurd this must have looked to Pilate? I don't know if you've ever thought through this. Here was a guy who they are accusing of being a ringleader to really revolt against the Roman government. And if that ringleader succeeded in doing his job as ringleader, right, then they would all be free from Roman rule. <laughs> and they wouldn't be paying their taxes to Rome, right? And so they're bringing this guy to Rome, to, to the Roman government saying, hey, this guy, he's, we're accusing him of leading a revolt against the Roman government, which we would benefit from, but we're not going to, we, we, we think he needs to be put to death instead. Do you see how absurd this sounds? Either, do you, you realize it's one of, one of two things. If he had any real chance or was any real threat to the Roman government, these people would be behind him, right? If he would had any real chance of actually making headway and leading a revolt that would be successful, they would have been behind him. They would have helped him. And if he was not a real threat, then this guy was just walking around as a lunatic, right? From the Romans' perspective, is that not true? This guy, okay, he thinks he's the son of God. He thinks he's going to take over the Roman government. Ha ha, very funny. You know, you're never, <laughs> that's never happening. If the guy wasn't a real threat, he's still not a real threat. And so this was the situation that they were in. They had to find some way to spin a story that made the Romans want to take action while not actually having any legitimate charge against him. And so either way, the Romans would have looked at him and said, we, he's not a problem for us. <laughs> You know, obviously you people aren't behind him. And obviously he's not going to overthrow Rome. He's got no legion. He's got those, his own servants ran away when you came to get him in the Garden of Gethsemane last night. You know, they, he was no threat. And so from Rome's perspective, this wasn't even, a, even something that should have been brought up to them. And, and Pilate knew it. Pilate obviously knew that. 
And so, what does Pilate say? We, this brings us the context that we now can understand, verse 31. It says, Pilate said unto him, said unto them, Take ye him, and judge him according to your law. But the Jews said unto him, It is not lawful for us to put any man to death, that the saying of Jesus might be fulfilled which he spake, signifying what death he should die. See, Pilate in his wisdom said, Okay, this isn't a matter that we care about here in Rome. <laughs> he says, If he's a problem for you, go judge him according to your law, and do whatever it is you do. You know, throw the book at him. Uh, go, go do your thing. He's a blasphemer, whatever. You know, this, this is where Pilate was at. And so they, he, they said, but no, the fact is, um, we don't want to judge him according to our law. Why not? Because the law that they used couldn't condemn Jesus. <laughs> there was no way for them to condemn it. They instead said, I, we don't want to put ourselves or him under our law. We want to put ourselves under your law. That's what they're saying. It's not lawful for us. Who was who made that law? It was the Roman law. The Romans said, okay, Jews, you have your law, you do your thing, have your courts, but we, you can't put people to death. And so what did the Jews say? We, we don't, we're, not under your, we're not under our law, we're under yours. <laughs> they put themselves willingly under a law of a secular Roman government instead of allowing themselves to be judged by Jesus. You realize that's really the second reason why they and a lot of times we don't want Jesus as our king. Because kings by default have authority. They have power and they ha make judgments, right? They have that power. They, they are the law, if you will. And this, of course, is what Jesus did many times to them. They, how many times had the Pharisees been judged by Jesus? Many, many times, right? He says, uh, this is scathing, Matthew 23 and verses 13 and 14. He said to them, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye shut up the kingdom of heaven against men. For ye neither go in yourselves, neither suffer ye them that are entering to go in. Do you know what he's saying in that verse? He's saying, you people who are supposed to be leading people to me <laughs> and to God's word and to God's truth. He says, what are you doing? He says, you are shutting up the kingdom of heaven. You're making it so people can't get in. You, you're not going in yourselves, and you're not allowing people that want to know about me to learn about me. This is the very job that they were there to do. And he says, you're doing the opposite. You're keeping people away from me. And he says, goes on in verse 14, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! Ye devour widows' houses, and for a pre pretense make long prayer. What does he say? Therefore ye shall receive the greater damnation. Now if there was anybody in Jewish society who was going to be received of God and blessed of him and have an eternity in heaven, the mindset would have been it's the great Sadducees and Pharisees, the great council, the great ones who were our religious leaders. What does Jesus say? You are going to receive more damnation, more hell, more punishment eternally than you can even imagine. <laughs> this is what Jesus, Jesus judged them openly. Now you can't think that that uh, didn't make them a little upset. Of course it did. So instead of allowing themselves to be judged by Jesus, allowing his words to penetrate them, allowing their hearts to be changed by his truth, which is truth, right? What would happen if they turned around to Jesus that day and says, we repent, Jesus, you're right. <laughs> Man, what would that nation have looked like? But they didn't. Instead of being judged, they wanted to turn the tables. They were going to now judge him. But they didn't even have the power to judge him according to their law. And ultimately, he would need to be condemned by the Roman government under the law of man. And the Bible says that they did this, the reason they had to bring him to Rome, it says that the saying of Jesus might be fulfilled which he spake, signifying what death he should die. You see, none of this, even in this terrible time, took Jesus by surprise. You know, and I, I sometimes get, feel like a broken record, <laughs> especially when it seems like we as a church or we as a, as a local community or uh, we have friends and family and whatever that are going through hard times. We go through times in our world that seem out of control. We seem like things are just 
completely like, how do we make sense of this? And you know what? We come back to the same saying that I seem to feel like I say all the time. God's still in control. <laughs> this didn't catch him by surprise. God knows what he's doing. He still sits on the throne. Those truths are things that we need to be reminded of. Because do you realize he sits on the throne through hurricanes? <laughs> He sits on the throne through difficult deaths and losses that we deal with our families. He sits on his throne no matter what tragedies of life may afflict us or affect us. The fact is, he still has a plan and a purpose in it. And we have to learn to trust him for that. Because here it is, Jesus Christ standing before uh, the council and the Roman government in a very, very bad time. And what did Jesus say? I already knew this was going to happen. That's what John brings out in this statement. He says, I already knew you were going to bring me to the Romans. I already knew that I was going to die on the cross. Jesus says, I already predicted that, and I told you that. John 3, 14, John records it earlier. Jesus says these words, As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Jesus told his disciples, this is how it's going to be. Matthew chapter 20 just before Jesus goes to Jerusalem in Matthew, the, the account gets recorded this way. Jesus says to his disciples, we go up to Jerusalem and the son of man shall be betrayed unto the chief priests. Well, that just happened. <laughs> and he says, they shall condemn him to death. Yeah, that just happened. And they shall deliver him to the Gentiles. They just did that to mock and to scourge and to crucify him. That was just about to happen. And it says, and the third day he shall rise again. You see, Jesus knew every detail of what was going to happen to him over that day, over that week. There wasn't anything that took him by surprise. There wasn't any question that the council asked him that he didn't already know was going to come. There wasn't any accusation or questioning from Pilate that was going to come to him that he wasn't already aware of. <laughs> he knew in the end this is the death he must die. And the Bible says... Jesus told his disciples in advance so that they could have, again, a greater assurance in who he was. So even in this great time of tragedy and worry and difficulty, their faith could be strengthened. How many times in the midst of tragedies and difficulties and disease and disasters do we find that either our, strength, our, our faith is strengthened or our faith is, is brought low. The fact is, when we recognize that he's in control, that he is still king, <laughs> that he still sits on his throne, even in the worst of times, when we recognize that, then in those difficult times, our faith can be strengthened as well. They didn't want to be judged, so they brought him up to Pilate. And how often do we reject Jesus because... We don't want to be judged either. That's unfortunately true for much of our world today. We don't want to obey his voice. People don't want to change their ways. People don't want to feel a heart of conviction that maybe they need to have a change. They need to have a humility. They don't want to be under his authority. We want to feel good about what we're doing, don't we? <laughs> we want to feel like I'm making my way in life and I'm trying to make the best decisions I can and I want to feel good about it in the end. And don't tell me I'm not. <laughs> Even if someone comes to you and says, I, I'm here to speak the truth and love to you, you're off path. You're going down the wrong way. You've got habits in your life you need to change. You know, here's what God's word has to say about what it is you're doing right now. And, I, and I'm just here to tell you because I care about you. I want you to, I want you to be back in that, in that place of fellowship with the Lord. And do you know what? how many times people turn you off <laughs> because you would say something like that? How many relationships can be destroyed? And you know what? That's oftentimes what keeps us from saying those things. We are the voice. We are to be the salt and light for Jesus Christ. And sometimes we have to say the hard things. Sometimes we have to show people where it is they fall short. Not because we're better from that than them, but as I've heard it once said, we're, we're beggars just like them, helping them to find out where to get the bread. <laughs> right? That's what we need to come in humility. Help each other. 
provoke each other to love and good works. That's what the Bible says we are to do as Christians. But the fact is, many of us reject Jesus being king of our life because we don't want the judgment. We don't want to be judged by him. Well, we have to keep moving. Let's look at verse 33. Verse 33, Pilate entered into the judgment hall, and again he called Jesus, and he said unto him, Art thou the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, and sayest, Jesus answered him, Sayest thou this thing of thyself, or did others tell it of me? And Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Thine own nation and the chief priests have delivered thee unto me. What hast thou done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight that I should be not delivered to the Jews. But now is my kingdom not from hence. Do you see something that maybe is hidden in this dialogue between Pilate and Jesus? In the sense that Pilate was obviously legitimately trying to determine whether Jesus had any any uh, there was any legitimacy to the claim that he was uh, worthy of death he asked the question are thou the king of the jews and we see this in every one of the gospel accounts and jesus answered him this way he says are you saying this for yourself this is what the another translation of this phrase might be are you saying this for yourself or are you saying this because someone has put you up to it because someone has told this about me. What was Jesus really getting at with this question? Well, you can see it in Pilate's response in just a minute when he answers, am I a Jew? Because Jesus, even in the midst of this frenzy, even in the midst of this dark time, he was ultimately asking Pilate, do you believe I'm the Christ? Do you believe I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man cometh unto the Father but by me? Are you saying this for yourself? Do you really want to know who I am? This is what he's saying. Are you saying this for yourself? Or is this just all procedural? <laughs> because I can tell you who I really am. Even in the midst of defending himself, what did he want to do? He wanted to draw that one last person to himself. He wanted to be that witness to Pilate. Bring that out to him. And, and of course, what does Pilate say? He says... Am I a Jew? <laughs> you know? I, maybe you are. Maybe you're the Christ that the Jews want, but you're not mine. <laughs> you might be their king. You might be king of the Jews, but you're certainly not my king. Maybe if I was a Jew, I'd be interested in knowing the answer to that question. This is where Pilate's at. But Jesus wanted to bring, bring him to that place, and fortunately, he rejected it. Because Jesus was not going to be the king of Rome or even the king of Jerusalem or the king of the Jews. He was to be the king of kings. And why does he say that? He says, because my kingdom is not of this world. He says, if my kingdom were of this world, then you would have a revolt on your hands, Pilate. <laughs> he says, if, if you think that, uh, that my kingdom were there right now, there wouldn't be anything you could do to stop me. This is what he's saying. My servants would have would have um would have fought he says my my servants would fight that i should not be even delivered to the jews he says the jews wouldn't have been able to get me and bring me here today if i were really setting up a kingdom on this earth right now he says but this is important now is my kingdom not from hence you notice that he says now he doesn't say, oh, don't worry, Pilate, my kingdom's a heavenly kingdom and it's, it's never going to be here. No, he says, as of right now, you're safe, Pilate. <laughs> he says, as of right now, my kingdom is not on this earth. But there's a day coming when his kingdom will be. <laughs> there is a day coming when he will come back. And he won't need the servants to pick up swords to help him. He won't need any of that because one word, he will speak. And all the nations shall bow before him. All the world shall be defeated before him. He will reveal himself as king of kings and lord of lords. And there won't be a king on this earth that can resist his power in that day. 
you know, the fact of the matter is, at this point in time, Jesus was a king. He was the kingdom of heaven. He wants to be the king of people's hearts. He wants people to come to him by faith, to trust in him, to put beside all of the sin and flesh and terrible things that are going to condemn them to hell and to trust him by grace through faith. And this is what he wants to do through all of the rest of the church age. He wants us to be his witnesses, to bring people to a place where they say, I'm going to ask Jesus to be my king. Not because he's going to take it by force. Not because he's going to kick the knees out from under us and cause us to fall down fat, flat before him. That day's coming. <laughs> that day's coming when every knee shall bow. <laughs> but you know what? Today, only the knees will bow that have their hearts yielded to him. And that's really what he wants. But how often do we see the same excuse? Well... That Jesus thing's good for you. I'm glad that church stuff works for you. I'm glad Jesus thing, you know, Jesus can be your king. You can live that way if you want to. Everybody has their own way, right? But he's not mine. Jesus might be your king, but he's not mine. Have you ever heard that in one way or another phrase from people you're trying to share Christ with? Well, Jesus is good. If that works for you, go do it, but he's not my king. This is effectively what Pilate was saying. He's saying, maybe you're the king of the Jews, but you're not my king. <laughs> the Pharisees were saying, well, you want to call yourself the king of Jews, but you're not going to be king of us. <laughs> the fact of the matter is, we have to willingly invite him to be the king of our life. And oftentimes we talk about salvation in the sense that, you know, Jesus does want to be our friend. He does love us. He did die for us. He cares about us. He wants us to come to him by faith. He doesn't want us to spend an eternity in hell. He wants us to be with him in a relationship in heaven. And he wants that fellowship, not only with each other, but with him. He, that's what God wants. But in the end, we can't forget the fact that he also wants to be our king. He wants to be in charge. When we yield our life to him, when we accept him, he wants us then to give our whole life to him. To bow down every stronghold, every fleshly desire, every bit of our own will, every bit of our own existence and our own resources and say, Lord, I give it all to you. You're my king. You deserve it. I yield it to you. This is what Christ has always wanted until the day he comes back and he causes every nation to bow before him. And so what do we see then? We have to continue and wrap this up. Verses 37 and, and 38 and following, it says, Pilate therefore said unto him, Art thou a king then? And basically, are you any kind of a king? And Jesus answered, Thou sayest that I am a king. And he say, he says, Jesus is saying, This is the charge you're bringing against me that I am a king, and to this end I was born, and for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. And Pilate saith unto him, What is truth? And when he had said this, he went out again unto the Jews, and said unto them, I find in him no fault, of, uh, no fault at all. You see, the final reason, I think, why people reject Christ as king is because they reject the truth. They just reject the truth. We, sometimes we'd just rather live in a lie, wouldn't we? You know, of course, back in uh, Roman days and Greek days, we had all kinds of philosophers. You know, of course, we all think of Socrates and Plato and some of the others. Maybe you had to read some of those in school. Or maybe you say, I wish that you didn't bring that up so I didn't have to remember that again. But the fact of the matter is, the Greeks and the Romans, they loved to debate truth. They loved to talk about your ideas and my ideas and how, how, you know, come up here and have an audience and let's talk about what your philosophy is. And this was a great, this was how they looked at education. In fact, that's how Paul, you remember when Paul and Mars Hill was able to stand before, he had an audience before all these Greek and Roman philosophers. Why? 
Because they wanted to hear his version of truth. <laughs> oh, then let's think about what you have to say, Paul. We're glad to give you an audience. Because why? Because everybody has their own truth. <laughs> there was no absolute truth. There was, you know, it sounds a lot like today, doesn't it? <laughs> everybody has their own truth today. Don't question me as to whether my truth is right and your truth is wrong. What is right and wrong? The world today says, well, it's right if I say it's right. <laughs> if it's right, then it's, it's right because it doesn't step on your, you, on, on your rights, then it's, then it's okay. I get to define my own morality. I get to define my own truth. That's, that's what our... Do you realize that our universities, our public universities today, are teaching no different than the Greek philosophers did in the first century? <laughs> it's the same thing. Same old thing, rehashed again. Same old lies of Satan. They keep coming around and around. But what does the Bible say? Thy word is truth. There's an absolute truth. God is truth. God is the author of truth. And Jesus says... He is the word in flesh. He is uh, the witness to the truth. Pilate didn't even know. He says, what is truth? We don't even believe in an absolute truth, Jesus. <laughs> but Jesus says, I came that I should bear witness unto the truth, and everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. John 1 tells us this in verse 114. The word, that's speaking of Jesus Christ. The word was made flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory. The glory as of the only begotten of the Father. What? Full of grace and truth. Jesus defined what truth really is. And the fact is, sometimes we reject Christ as king. Sometimes the world does because we like our version of truth better. <laughs> we like the morality that we've manufactured. We, we like the, the practical ethics that we've developed. And do you realize how many practical ethics have really swept into our own thinking as Christians as well? How many times have we said, oh, well, we can do this because it's not so bad. <laughs> it's, it's more convenient this way. And it really, you know, God's word, you know, it's outdated. You know, we don't have to listen to every word it says. You know, we, we like to feel, we won't fit into society if we don't do it this way. <laughs> you know, there's so many examples that we could go through with this, but I don't have time. But the fact of the matter is, there are many, many times when we like to just put God's truth aside and live according to ours. And when we do that, we are ultimately rejecting the kingship of Jesus Christ. His word is true. His life was perfect. His teaching was true. And he wants us to follow him and follow his truth and make him our king. And so what happens as a result? Verses 39 and 40, he says, You have a custom that I should release unto you one at the Passover. Will ye therefore that I release unto you the king of the Jews? And they say, nuh -uh. They cried all again, saying, no, not this man, but Barabbas. Now, Barabbas was a robber. That's all John says about it. Barabbas was truly a criminal. And just to put this in perspective... They had rejected Christ as king for all these other reasons. And do you see what the end result was? They would rather have a known, convicted criminal running rampant in their midst than to have Jesus running free and healing and helping the poor and the sick. You know how many people Jesus helped during his ministry? They would rather have a convicted criminal on the... You know we have... These amber alerts or whatever they are, I don't know what it, what it is, uh, predator alerts, you know, whatever that is, you know, every now and then you get an email or some predator moved into your neighborhood and he's a, he's a convicted criminal and he's gotten out and you need to know this, right? And uh, our society tries to warn people in different ways, in different fashions, when there is, um, I'm driving down the highway, you see somebody kidnapping, you know, right? That somebody kidnapped somebody, and it's the, here's the license plate number, right? You see this kind of stuff happening all the time. We try to, as a society, warn people when there's a criminal 
running loose, <laughs> right? But do you realize when we reject Jesus Christ as king, what are we ultimately telling God? <laughs> I'd rather live with my own sin. I'd rather live in the sin around me. I'd rather allow those things to run rampant in my life than I would to allow Jesus Christ to have the authority in me. That's ultimately what we're saying when we don't allow Christ to be our king. We cry the same things. As strange as it may seem, we, we read that, we say, why would these people have ever let Barabbas go? Well, it's a natural consequence. Either Jesus will be your king or you'll find that you'll be allowing sin to just run rampant. It's a result. This is what we do. We make that choice.